Welcome to Booktopia TV. I'm John Purcell and I'm here with Fable Parrot, author of Past the Shallows, and coming in August, When the Night Comes. Welcome Fable. Thanks very much for having me. I've been um, reading your latest book. It's been um, quite, a, quite an amazing little journey. I mean, it's, a, it's not a very, it's not a massive book, but it takes, so, goes through so many different um, areas of, of the characters' lives um, in sort of little layers, um, nice little layers. How did you put this book together? Because it seems that it's, um, there's so many separate little lines of story. It's like little memories being tied together. It's been a really interesting process. Um, I seem to write out of order and not really knowing the full story while I'm writing, which is frustrating. So I end up with a lot of scenes um, and I'm not sure where they go in the story or if they even will make it into the story. And this book I ended up with a lot of scenes that didn't make it into the final book, probably as many as there are in the book. But, um, and I wasn't sure that the two storylines were going to go together and it was only probably two months before the proof actually came together, the final manuscript, that it, that it fell into place, it found a structure. So I start writing from character, so I had Isla and I had this Danish sailor called Bo and I just followed what they sort of told me. And I also had a great experience of um, going to Antarctica and working on a supply vessel, the Aurora Australis. And that gave me a really great insight into what it's like to work on a ship in the ice. And what, what does the title, When the Night Comes, refer to? What, what, where does that come from? My titles are always really hard and I have a lot of working titles as I go and they change. They sort of morph and as, a, as the themes of the book change. I had um, t Tell Me About the Sea, um, I can't remember some of the others, but there were lots and they really seemed right at the time, but then a few months later they're not right, they don't fit. But when I was uh, heading to Antarctica, it was during summer, so the further south you get, the less night there is, until there is no night at all, and the sun is up the whole time, and the sun just goes around the horizon, and you can get sunburn at 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, and it's very bizarre. You wake up and you go, it must be morning, and you look at your watch and it's 2 a.m., and the sun is bright in the sky. And I kept writing in my notebook, when the night comes, when the night comes, when the night comes. And when it came time, time to uh, just decide on a, on a title, it was the clear winner, and I think it means different things for the two characters when the night comes. One, it's fear. Both of them have had some fear about night time. Um, but it, it also is a positive thing too. So yeah, it, it was a clear winner. It was a strong theme through the book, night and day, light and dark. Well, I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to write a review about, about the book because um, as, I'm, as I'm reading, I'm often jotting down different aspects. Yeah. And what I've, what I've sort of come to with it for, for the way I, I interpret it, is um, it's a it's like a I suppose a modern version of Marcus Aurelius' Stoicism. Like there's a there's a, a great awareness of the permanence and the uh, of, of nature and the the the, the, the sort of the, the the deal we have to come to when yeah. we're dealing with these massive forces. Yeah. Um, and it's got something to teach um, us. I think the book because it's. It's so much about memory, so much about your past, you know, your past life in, in Hobart, yeah. um, and then these experiences you've had um, uh, on going down to Antarctica as well. And it's, there are things that aren't great in people's past, and they sort of bubble up in this story. And they, the characters seem to approach them um, with a kind of um, stoicism. It seems to, they don't seem to get knocked down completely by these things. Yeah. They, they feel them. They respect them. They have all those emotions, but the way in which both the, the lines of story deal with those issues um, is very um, inspirational. Like it, it makes you think about other things that you may may have sort of had chained around your leg. And, yeah. and reading this, I feel like I could almost cut them away and say, "Yes, yeah. that was a part of my past. Uh, it was dark, or it was nice, or it was whatever, but I'm not going to let it hold me back." I felt like um, one of the major themes in the book is kindness, what, what a difference kindness can make. And kindness is a very gentle force that we, we often overlook as a, as a positive human virtue, but I think it's one of the most important things for humans to be or to feel a sense of kindness. 
And for the, the girl, the young girl character, what a difference kindness makes from this stranger who makes her feel like despite her past and despite her present, her future could be anything that she wants it to be. But for the for Bo, for the Danish character, he's really trying to work out his past by taking this journey that um, his father has done before him and that is something that he never wanted to do but is he has to do. He has to do, he's driven to be a sailor like many sailors are. You know, when they're on the land they miss the sea and when they're at sea they miss home. I love the effect that kindness has in the book because uh, early on when um, when um, we first meet the red boat and he's waving down to her um, and she's looking up and she just he she's, can see her. Yeah, and she's Someone just sort of yeah, her. and she's sort of astounded yeah. um, by it. Um, and then um, when um, Bo's about to get onto the boat and he meets the young the young um, steward and they sort of have their little chat where, yeah. where the, the, the voluble steward talks 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 and Bo sort of just oh. yeah and just, you see me we're 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 going to be together for a long time I like you. And you're being nice to me. Oh, yeah. It's so fascinating to me. Out of all of the thousands of people you meet, there's some people you have an instant connection with, and sometimes there's no explanation for that. It can, it can be that instant that you recognise. I see you. You see me. We have this understanding, and it can be with a stranger in another country that you'll never see again. But you can have a brief thing where you know, I know you. Yeah. I know you. I know your story, and you have a, a connection. So it's sort of about that. Um, Bo sees this girl when she feels invisible. Hobart, she feels like she's a grey ghost almost, um, blending into the scenery, but he sees her and what a difference that can make when someone can see you, who you are, and it's okay to be who you are. And um, I think, yeah, for Bo, his friend, this guy that just talks and talks and talks, sees him and, and likes him. Yeah. And it's easy to be around this person. And he's very different than Bo, but it's calming to be around this person that's so excited and so talking all the time and really passionate about everything and living life to the full, so to go along with that ride, you know, that really helps Bo. So he feels that when it's missing. Um, I just I just want to go back to Past the Shallows because um, it had an incredible success um, and it was out there, but I'd like you to sort of, uh, for those who don't know the book, who are coming to it for the first time and, and uh, hopefully um, you know, a lot of booksellers have read the book, they were in love with the new book, yeah. so they'll be selling it out there. So hopefully your name will be out there again in, in the coming months. And can you just tell people about, about um, Past the Shallows? What was it about sure. um, and you know, why they should read it? Absolutely. Well, Past the Shallows is set in the very um, south of Tasmania, so a really isolated, ancient, wild place. And it's about um, two brothers mainly, Miles and Harry, uh, living in a pretty bad situation and their dad's an abalone diver and having to um, work long hours and um, poach abalone and do different risky things to try and keep food on the table. And their mum um, died in a car accident when they were quite young. And secrets about that car accident are sort of coming to the surface as you read the book and making things tenser and putting those boys in a bit of danger. So really it's about the bond between siblings, like to me, and again about kindness. I know that book, there's a real, a real theme about kindness, especially for the younger boy. He befriends a, um, an elderly man that lives in the middle of nowhere and there's a kindness between them, a, a kindness that he shows, this, shows Harry and also the kindness that dogs show, um, can show you when you feel really alone. So. Um, and other, other animals, um, the relationship you can have with animals that are kind, that inform you about kindness. Um, yes, yeah, so that's basically what the book's about. So um, the relationship between brother and sister in um, the books, is, that's largely based on your own relationship with your I, younger brother? I think for both of the books definitely it was easy to write um, Miles and Harry because of the relationship I had with my brother, but for this book even more so, um, you know, I've dedicated the book to my brother. We're really close. Um, was it a shared sort of, uh, I wouldn't say trauma, but that, that breaking away from Melbourne, moving to Tasmania at that young age? It, I mean, it's interesting. I, I'm, I'm the oldest, so I think it's probably uh, different for the younger one because they have a sibling to sort of um, look, look to for help or for reassurance. Um, 
you know, this, this book isn't exactly my story. It becomes fiction, and also I think memory is fiction. If you if you do have siblings and you talk, you will know memory is fiction because you can be talking about something in your childhood, and your siblings like it didn't happen like that, and you've got two completely different perspectives. So, um, but I did talk a lot with my brother, and we, it, some things came up that we never knew about it about each other and that was amazing it's been a nice experience but yeah it's fiction but there's some real things I really did move to Hobart with my mum and my brother we went by boat and we lived um, in a rented property and it was a it was a strange time and it was a new city and it felt far away and it was an island so it felt isolated and it's very cold and it was very different and, and old and sort of I just remember it being filled with ghosts so quite frightening for a young kid um, Hobart is of course very different now, it's got a lot more people and more life and back then it really was, you'd never see anyone on the street or in the phone books or in the milk bar, it's just so very, it's like everyone was missing, there were just these houses with ghosts in them. Um, and I really did get the ferry to school and I loved that, so that um, was nice to revisit that. And I really did know the Nella Dan, so um, not as much as Isla did in the book. But my mum had a really good friend that worked as a steward um, on the Nella Dan. She was from Tasmania and she went as a passenger first and then it was like, I have to work on this ship and became a steward. Um, and my mum and her are still friends. But as a result, a lot of the Danes would come to our house for parties of dinner and I loved it. And I remember the, um, the first time I ever smelt real coffee because this is back in the 80s and yeah. it was instant. Nobody had real coffee, so that smell and the, the filter and the, the thermoses, um, and also how disgusting I thought herring was pickled herring on a <laughs> you know, getting in all their beards and stuff. And now I love herring, so it's interesting. And what about what is it about the um, Danes or, or, or the Scandinavians that, that you find is attractive? My memories were of kindness again, and I've, I've been on this great journey of research. I contacted a lot of um ex Nelligan, um crew and so and he, so many of them have talked to me and I've been to Denmark and you know the kindness and the generosity and the love for this ship that they still have and um, many of the Danes still cry um, when you talk to them about this ship you know they're just their eyes are full of tears and um, you know or you'll say do you miss sailing with Nella Dan and they go no only every day they think of it every day. They have tattoos of Nella Dan. Many of their houses, there's stuff from Nella Dan everywhere. Um, and the kindness, I, I was just taken, um, taken sailing, taken into people's homes and fed and plied with alcohol and met their whole families and neighbours, you know, f made real friends. I've got lots of friends in Denmark now. And just the, um, yeah, the generosity and the kindness, I just, it was so lovely. I think I didn't want to finish the book because I didn't want to stop doing the research because <laughs> I was having um, too much fun. It's been a great experience. So your experience in Tasmania wasn't great. You left uh, as early as you could. Yeah. Right? So since you were grown it's up, true. you were out of there. It's true. And your, your, your imagination stays there. Yeah, I never wanted to write about Tasmania. I, I, I left at 16 and I thought, that's it, I'm never going back. Um, when I first started to write Past the Shallows, I really fought writing about the South. I didn't want to, and I was like, oh, it just keeps coming up. Then the second book, I thought, no, I'm not going to write about Tasmania. It just, I found these photos of the Nella Dan that I used to have on my wall when I was young, and that was it. I just had to go on that journey. So yeah, I've been back in Tasmania again for three years working on this book. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with it. It's so beautiful. It's um, great and then the, the cold and the dark and the ghosts they're still there for me yeah. so I go there and for three days I have a great time and then on the fourth day I can feel that feeling coming down that I felt when I was a kid and I'm like okay it's time to go. A lot of expats have that relationship with the place they grew up in. Yeah. Um, you know, the Peter Carey and, and Christina Stead and yes. they go they leave and yet they constantly hark back on these, these early moments of their yes. I think it's going to be with me for a while and I think there's probably a few more books that will feature Tasmania or at least the water. Um, you know, if I could get enough money to just sail the Southern Ocean and write at sea, I would do that for the rest of my life. <laughs> so just, just, um, just before you uh, before we finish, finish up, I, Antarctica, you've been down there 
Um, can you tell yeah. me about it? I mean, I get, I get a lot from the book, but um, what was your experience of it, your first hand experience? Right, so, um, firstly you pass through the, the wildest part of the Southern Ocean, so 50 degrees south and beyond where it gets really wild. So I'm talking, you know, 20, 12 metre seas, 100 kilometre winds, and the albatross following the boat, whales. Then you start hitting the ice. So at first it's just clink, 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 clink against the ship, and you're in your bunk and you sort of look outside and there's just little bits of ice. Then it gets thicker and thicker, and then sometimes you stop and the ship, ship, ship is shuddering and reversing and ramming the ice. And you'll look out of your porthole and there'll just be an emperor penguin just sitting on a bit of ice or an Adelie, uh, an Adelie penguin or a Weddell seal and it's, it's almost like you've taken some kind of drugs and you're having some weird hallucination. You're just like, is this real? And I spent Christmas, Christmas Day was my first massive iceberg. I woke up and I was just like, wow. But then you hit the, the continent, so it's such a strange feeling. At first, you know, loaded off the ship for ages because the most important stuff is to get the expeditioners off and, the, and all the cargo, so you're not important. So you just have to wait. So you wait one day, two days, three days, four days, and you're like, please, can I go? You've got to grab any opportunity. And eventually they'll say, yes, you can go if you do the dishes for a day over there. And I'm like, yes, I'll do it, do it. Um, and off you go um, on a barge and then stepping onto the continent is amazing because firstly, it's the reef supply is all in, going on. So there's cranes and, and bulldozers and everything, beeping machines, but there's just penguins everywhere, literally. And um, it's, it's just so bizarre. You, you, you can't really, take it all in. And then you're inside in the base and it's just normal. It's like people are just getting around in their shorts and t-shirt and doing their daily work. But then you'll say, can I go for a walk? And there's certain areas you're allowed to go. And I got a chance, they said, I, they gave me one hour and you, you suit up in your freezer suit and um, sunscreen on because it's so bright. Um, and I walked up Reeves Hill, so it's a hill of stones and there's a big memorial cross um, for a man that died in the 70s, an Australian expeditioner. And you walk up there and it's silent and you just look out onto the bay and you can see a ship. And this ship was orange, Aurora Australis, but Nelodan was red. And if I squinted, it's the same place that Nelodan was for 26 years, all the years she worked. She was in that bay, she built this bay, she brought everyone here for so many years. And it was such an amazing experience because the same view that the Danes would have been looking at, the same um, anchor point. It's the same view I've actually seen because I've read the Exactly, book. Uh, and then the snow petrels came. Yeah. And I just, you know, it's, I wept. Antarctica doesn't need humans, doesn't want us there. It's very harsh to live there. It's so dry that your skin peels off your face. You've got to put lip balm on constantly because it just, you know, and if you didn't have the base, you would die in a very short time. It's, extreme and I think we need to be custodians of this place and to look after it but it's not for us and I would love for us to leave one part of the world just to the creatures they really need that place penguins the skewers the um, seals that uh, the, the whales um, all of the krill everything that lives in that place is a cycle of life it doesn't have anything to do with humans at all and I think let's go and look at it let's enjoy it but let's um, protect it and look after it and may mining never happen in a time. Yeah, yeah.